Uh, so James, thanks for uh, talking to me and the students at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I think what you've got to say is going to be valuable, uh, especially around the topic of artificial intelligence, which we're looking at inside the course. Your book, uh, Our Final Invention, uh, looked at artificial intelligence. Uh, it gained a lot of attention. Uh, a lot of people have said that it was an important book. Uh, but what caused you to look at AI? Why did, why was this a particular interest for you? Well, since about the year 2000, uh, by the way, thanks very much for having me. And I'm, it, it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking uh, to your students at the University of Waterloo. Um, I was interested in AI way back in the year 2000. And the book that really turned me on to it, which is still great, is Ray Kurzweil's The Age of Spiritual Machines. And in that book, and all of Kurzweil's book, he tends to be very rosy about the future with AI. It's, he, he promises all these, all these wonderful benefits, and then he donates about this much to the downside. Shortly after uh, I read that book, I, had the, um, I, I make documentary films most of the time. And I had the opportunity to interview Arthur C. Clarke, who, if your students don't know, is one of the giants of science fiction. He's dead now. He, I think he died in 2013. Um, but I spent a day with him in Sri Lanka, where he lives. And we were talking about AI. He, if you recall, created the HAL, uh, the HAL 9000, the, the homicidal robot from, uh, the homicidal computer from 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I was, we were talking about the good side of AI. And he said, well, you know, it may not actually be like that. Intelligence will win out in any form. He said, we steer the future, we humans, because not because we're the fastest or the smart, uh, fastest or the strongest creature, but because we're the most intelligent. And when we share the planet with something more intelligent than we are, they will steer the future. And so this is the question I began asking uh, artificial intelligence experts. And all of them were, you know, the, you, you, if you're a professional in any field, you have to be kind of optimistic about it and, and go, go and push forward. And, uh, they would don't they would give a little bit of time in their talks to uh, oh yes there is a downside we could we could lose control <laughs> so what did that mean so I started probing into those into those uh, into those questions um, and I got a bunch of very interesting answers absolutely and from what I was able to see you started off optimistic as you've described but then you came to uh, the view that artificial intelligence would eventually become more powerful than we are uh, and take over the world. So I was interested in that process because clearly that's something that uh, opinions have been expressed on, but sure. you have articulated you know, a process by which you think this will happen. Well, let's, let's um, it, it helps me to take it step by step because I want you, uh, the, your students to know that there are issues with AI right now. First, first of all, AI is a dual use technology. We have to remember that it's capable of great good and great harm. We can see some of the harms right now. As Stephen Hawking said, in the short term, the problem with AI is who controls it. In the long term, the problem is can it be controlled at all? So let's look at some of the short term problems that we're having is issues with right now. Um, AI and automation are going to cause massive technological unemployment and uh, economic disruption. This is just a fact. The, the estimates are that Gartner and company say, and MIT say that by 2030, half of all jobs will be taken by AI and automation. That's huge economic disruption. Um, anything that's automated, anything that involves any kind of routine, and I'd urge your students to steer away from those jobs. Don't, you know, anything in a factory, anything that, that does anything repetitive, all accounting, all post office work, all, uh, you know, if you don't be a radiologist, computers can already do it better. Don't be a driver. Within five years, most drivers jobs will be taken. And that in America, that's 5 million jobs. Um, do things that require human, human emotional intelligence. We can, we can get into that if you want, but there's, there'll be huge economic disruption. So this is a, a side of AI we didn't see. Um, there are people developing, that's one. Two, people are developing autonomous battlefield robots and drones. And these are machines that kill people without a human in the loop. They, 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 find, they identify a target, they, they, they kill it. 
Um, the, the, this research is being richly funded in the United States, Great Britain, Israel, Russia, India, and China. They're funding this. This I, it wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that this is already in the field. That that I'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. It's our, our, so. And and here's the problem: we're leaping into this technology without answering basic ethical questions. Uh, that they're, they're governed by the the rules of armed warfare. How do you, how does an AI tell a civilian from a combatant? How does an AI tell a friend from a foe? Until we can answer these questions, there's going to be there will be huge mistakes on the battlefield, and we we can we can anticipate them. So we have to suspend that development until we're sure of how to how to accomplish these things. Um, another another thing that's happening right now, not at all futuristic, is data bias. Data bias in AI. Right now, um, the dominant part of machine learning is are called artificial neural nets. And what scientists have found a few years ago, now it's really taken over the industry, is if you take a lot of data, put it through simple learning algorithms, then you get immense predictive capabilities. So people are using it for facial recognition. People are using it for language translation. If you put in, put in a f teach the system on good French-English translation and then input French and you'll get really good English. Um, but it requires a lot of data. Now, the databases that they're using sometimes are very old. So, for example, they're biased against, against women and, and minorities. I'll give you a couple of examples. One, in Great Britain, they were using algorithms to choose who gets to go to college. Well, when, there's, when, that, when that data that was fed into those algorithms was made, it was in the 80s and 90s, when not as many women or minorities were applying to colleges. So, in 2020, these are making decisions based on ideas from from 20 from 1980 1990 and so it wasn't allowing as many women or minorities into into universities same thing with job applications same thing with mortgages same thing all over america with sentences for for crimes it used to be in this country and in many countries that blacks traditionally just by custom got got harsher pr prison sentences well all that data was used to make today's sentencing algorithms and so this, this, is, this is a giant problem that, that the corporations don't have a, 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 an easy answer to. Another, another problem we've got, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop it with the short-term problems, but these are, all the things that are these are things that are happening right now with AI that we need to be aware of. This is what makes it a dual-use technology. Sure, we get a lot of good things with AI. And I, I, you know, anyone involved in, in corporate life knows that AI is, is, the, is the, uh, it's, it's the, the Midas touch of today. But another one is um, privacy. Uh, your privacy and mine, your, your identity and mine are, 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 are uh, is stored and, and sold, bought and sold. It, selling data about us is a $5 billion a year industry in the United States alone. Um, and what happens? Wh why is that bad? Well, we take, take Facebook. Um, a few years ago, Facebook gave the data, the personal data of, of 80 million Americans to a company called Cambridge Analytica, which gave it, which sold it to the Russians, which used it to try and manipulate the 2016 election for president here. And they did that by, by uh, targeting those 80 million people with ads that disparaged Hillary Clinton and promoted Donald Trump. We don't know what impact that had, but we know that they tried and they tried very hard. And this was a giant abuse of, of, of privacy, a giant abuse of data. Um, and these are the issues we have to keep an eye on. Uh, and we can go on to, uh, you know, if, if you have an interim question, that, that'd be fine. Or we could go on to the... To the, the I do. <laughs> sure, let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about some things. Okay, so uh, my interim question would be that my sense is that you think this is going to continue. So that these things are going to get worse as opposed yep. to being a short-term problem that may be something that is, uh, you know, part of the development of this technology and eventually would disappear. Uh, instead, you think this is going to continue to get worse and, you know, the consequences are going to be bad. I do because there's a giant gulf between what the public understands about AI and how companies that are very sophisticated like Facebook, Google, Apple, 
uh, Baidu in China, IBM, the way they use the technology. There's a giant gulf. And there's also a giant gulf between how our legislators, what they know, our, our, our government, what it knows, and, and the sophistication of these companies. So uh, we're going to, all of these companies, Facebook does pretty, pretty obnoxious things all the time. They're, uh, they've been putting up um, essentially lies and in the form of, of posts and news posts, and they haven't been monitoring it very, very, very carefully. And that's just the beginning. That's just the tip of the iceberg for them. Google employs 400 lawyers, uh, the, the, partly because they, they, they've been sued in 20 countries for everything from privacy violations to predatory business practices to uh, stealing intellectual property. Um, Apple was just caught for using, uh, letting the, uh, acknowledging that their, uh, their major contractor in China called Foxconn was using child labor. And that, that this was something they knew three years ago. Foxconn has its own scandals. They used to have a lot of suicides um, in the factories because of the horrible working conditions. So all of these companies, IBM is, is also complicit. If you, if you really want to scare yourself, look at IBM's uh, involvement in uh, with Nazi Germany in World War II. So I, I don't think that this the situation is going to get better. In fact, I think it's going to get worse. And the more the, the more advanced AI gets, the more serious these uh, these these crimes will be, and the more dangerous for us. And presumably, there will be some, or maybe there won't, uh, awareness by the public that this is becoming a problem or that things are happening which are, you know, undesirable from their point of view. Uh, and my question really is, will that offset to some degree the negative development of AI? Uh, and my sense is you're saying that it won't, that we're on a path to a fairly negative place. Yes, I'm not the guy to go to for good news. I, I'm very skeptical about about this, I, there are some solutions. There, um, the public is slowly getting uh, involved and getting aware. There are, uh, there's been a, come a cottage industry in organizations that are dedicated to uh, investigating AI ethics and AI safety. There's, there's the Future of Life Institute there in in Cambridge. There's the Future of Humanities Institute in the UK. Um, there's an old, an old one, an oldie but goodie is MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute in California. There's the nonprofit branch of OpenAI. And there's a bunch of organizations that have come up like, like roses uh, since like 2015 <clears throat> to try and uh, monitor AI safety and ethics, write papers about it, and influence people. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical about their progress because they're, they're, they, they're often... Uh, work hand in hand with the organizations that they're trying to trying to uh, whose behavior they're trying to modify. Um, the, the relationship is a little too cozy. If the people get involved, if the people and this is what I urge everyone to do is get get up to speed on AI, then they can they can start voting for politicians. There's a, a gentleman named Yang who's uh, running going to run for mayor of New York and he had a presidential candidacy. He's the only one in the field who's talking about AI safety and the necessity for, for, for regulation. So my advice is, and I urge people to look at, your, look at your candidate's platform, look for AI, look for AI safety and ask them, if it's, if it's not there, ask them why not. Tell them, you know, tell them you're tired of, of giving away your, your privacy, your data for free. Tell them you're tired of being threatened by, uh, by giant monopolies like Facebook and, and Google and Apple. So you're saying the public can do something about mm. it and should. You're, tell, you're saying that they should do that. Yeah. Uh, but overall, you're still pessimistic is my sense. Uh, I, I don't want to go, you know, be yeah. uh, too dark about this, but you well, are painting a picture which is quite dark. Well, I, yeah, and I, I do that unapologetically um, because all the most of the news out there, and that's why I, I love Ray Kurzweil. He's... A, he's uh, uh, I love reading him. I love his. I love the quality of his mind. He he won the Thomas Edison Prize for all his inventions. He he invented the machine that reads books to the blind, um, and he he was a pioneer in optical in uh, optical character recognition. Re, uh, 
and voice recognition. He's he's really been a leader in in, in AI and in and in technology, but he's painted a very rosy picture of what's what what can happen with AI. Um, recently, fortunately, some other technologists like Elon Musk, he said we've opened Pandora's box. He knows a lot about techno technology. Stephen Hawking has said probably the most interesting things, and he said. Um, in the short term, we're going to get great benefits from AI. In the long term, we could lose control. Bill Gates said roughly the same thing. Stuart Russell, who wrote the textbook or co-wrote the textbook on AI, it's called AI, A Modern Approach. Stuart Russell came out with a book called Human Compatible. And he talks about the necessity for now, right now, building machines that, are, are, that have human safety and ethics in mind um, as, as part of corporate governance. This is, this is a must. Stuart Russell, he knows, you know, anything he knows about AI is not worth knowing. Uh, he literally wrote the book. He was one of the pioneers of, uh, of artificial neural nets, the branch of machine learning that's really revolutionizing the industry. So fortunately, I'm not the only one banging this gong um, by far. And in fact, I, when I started, when I wrote this book, I was, uh, there were people like Eliezer Yudkowsky and, and, uh, and a few others who had been been talking about this for years that the whole ai risk thing but if you want we could step we can step into the the, ne the next phase the part that we really should be worried about and this this is you you said <laughs> we go dark well this is as dark as it gets right here okay. there's, a, there's an idea there's an idea called the intelligence explosion that was um put out by a, a, math, a british mathematician in the 1960s called ij good and he said, basically, uh, we're creating machines that are as, are, are as good at better or better than humans at many tasks. And we can see that now. Right now, they're better at, he said this many years ago, he said, right now, they're better at navigation. They're better at theorem proving. They're better at all kinds of calculation. Uh, soon, they'll be better at, at, at many kinds of things like radiology. Uh, they're much better at, uh, ob they're getting better at object recognition, at facial recognition. They're going to get better at translation. A day will come, to paraphrase I.J. Good, a day will come when, when machines are better than we are at artificial intelligence research and development. Then they will set the pace of intelligence growth, not humans. But then we're stuck in this dilemma. Um, we've never had a technology before that could outsmart us. We don't know if it's going to be to treat us nicely. <laughs> um, we, we can use, we, we, we have no technology that we can re really refer to, to, to learn how to, be, how to uh, survive in a world where we're living with machines that are a thousand or a million times more intelligent than we are. We can use our own evolution as an example. And that's what, to go back to what Arthur C. Clarke said, we rule the future because, not because we're the fastest or the strongest creature, but because we're the most intelligent. When something is a, a thousand or millions of times more intelligent than we are, and we, we, don't, we don't know if there's a top end to intelligence, we don't know if there's an upper limit to intelligence. When we're sharing the planet with something like that, we have no idea if we'll even understand it, much less be able to control it. We have no idea how to make it safe and compliant. Um, I.J. Good, who came up with the intelligence explosion idea, initially thought when he wrote that idea in the 1960s, he thought um, computers would help us solve our most dire intractable problems. But by the, by the time he died, he had said, no, it's not gonna be like that. But he said in 2010, he died three years later, he said, what I've, what, what I've learned in the intervening years is that we follow the money, that we'll pursue money and we'll go like lemmings off a cliff, even though it's a myth about lemmings. We will like, be led like lemmings off, the, off a cliff by the, the, the need to, um, the desire for the for, for quarterly profits. So the intelligence explosion idea is that we'll reach a, a place of human level intelligence. And then beyond that, the machines will be able to do AI R and D better than we do. Their intelligence will take off and we'll cease to understand what's going on. And we, and this is called there's two words your students can can look up, two phrases. One is uh, one is the, uh, besides the intelligence explosion, the, this is called, the paraphrase is called the control problem. Um, 
And what we're, what, we're, what we're really trying to do is, there's another phrase called value alignment. We want to make sure that the machines we create, that their values are aligned with our survival and, and, and benefit. So if I think of, I'm trying to think of examples of what the world might look like or things that might happen in the world when we reach this type of position, when the machines are in some way in control. And the example that comes into my mind might be the problem of the, the new Boeing 737, mm. where the pilots were, you know, piloting the plane, but the plane decided that the, that the plane had to do things that clearly killed the people on board the plane, uh, that did this overriding the pilots, and the pilots were not able to do anything about that. You know, they were sitting there, the plane was doing things that they knew were bad and were, and were you know, going to have a bad outcome. And uh, while they tried to fix this, the plane wouldn't respond and made other decisions based on them trying to stop it doing what they wanted it to do. So that seems, now if, if we looked at that in other areas, presumably that could apply in an environment like a factory where there are workers, where the technology could rec uh, um, recommend changes that were bad for the people working in the factory in some way, perhaps less safe, perhaps increasing the intensity of work to a point that was uh, that, that was bad. Uh, so uh, is this the sort of thing that you think will be happening when we reach that point? Absolutely, and that's an excellent example. I, I have not thought of that. I, I'm going to write, I'm going to I'm going to borrow that from you. Welcome. It's open Forever. source. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to use that example because it couldn't be more clear. The the, the machine thought it knew better. Mm. Uh, the machine thought it had the best interests in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's another thing going on there. So, so that's that's exactly what could happen. Um, Just one more. The algorithms. Sure that were driving misinformation and fake news. Presumably, you know, yeah. that is similar to this too. It is, it is. Uh, the fake news is especially pernicious because these were algorithms that were created intentionally to fill people's heads full of lies and conspiracies, and it worked. I mean, we have a, mm -hmm. we have a, a shocking number of people in the United States who, who have totally fallen prey to this, uh, this, this mind control by the by algorithms and it goes into um, it goes into social media and it goes into video games and it goes into basically the whole ecology of the internet is designed to make you look at products and to get your eyeballs on the products and it's and they, they you know there, there are people far smarter than I uh, who are out there programming these algorithms um, to to make us susceptible kids are especially susceptible um, all these, all these social media, and they they serve one purpose: to gather data about us, to sell us things, and it it works brilliantly. I mean, look at the look at the revenue of uh, of 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 Facebook, of of Google. It's it's these are these aren't these aren't like companies. These are like nation states. If they were countries, they'd be in the top ten richest countries in the world. Um, but yeah. Uh, the, the, I'm, I want to go back to your plane example. Go ahead. Imagine, Im, imagine if uh, if the if algorithms were in control of the uh, of the uh, the power grid. Look what's happened in Texas. I, I, I refer to that in, in my in my in our final invention, my book, because a few years ago there was a company called Enron that was manipulating the power grids in California on purpose, call it causing rolling blackouts to 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 increase the price of energy and improve their bottom line so they could all buy another fancy car. So that's the kind of ethics that are get that are, that are behind a lot of these a lot of these technologies but you can see what happens when the grid is tampered with by the grid failure in Texas. You, we have literally millions of people without <coughs> without energy, without water, without the vital things we need and we know that the rest of the country is equally if not more dependent on their grid than, um, than uh, Texas, and the grid is underpinned by a bunch of AI. It, in every state, there, there, there are control systems that control the grid, and they allow uh, 
operators to control the grid, but there's a ton of AI embedded in that. And there's already been hackers messing, messing with that AI. But uh, the other, the other uh, the, the, example, the, the example that comes to mind is, if, if you look at uh, our final invention, my book, I, I talk about the basic drives of AI. And we think that AI will be benign, but AI, in fact, there's really good reasons to believe it will have basic drives. And this is a theory that was established by a man called Steve Amahundro. If you want to have some fun, uh, Google Amahundro, which is spelled phonetically Amahundro. And Google Amahundro and basic drives, and you'll get a very well-written paper about why we should think, based on rational agent economic theory, why we should think that AI will have some drives. So one of those drives will be to to acquire and consolidate energy because it needs energy to fulfill its goals. And so it won't be, it won't just be waiting for uh, instructions. It will be taking action like that airplane. Uh, and it will be doing things like acquiring energy. Well, you know, if it thought that Texas had a bunch of energy that it, that it needed, unless you give it explicit countervailing instructions, then it would, it could tap into Texas's energy grid or any other of the interconnected energy grids around the country. So the lights could go off everywhere and nobody would know what was happening, except the, the AI, suddenly we'd, we'd realize that the, that the AI in some Google um, cloud had, had, had uh, enough awareness and self-preservation to really want all the energy. So this is the kind of, and I talk about that kind of accident in, uh, in our final invention. What I still wonder to a degree is whether uh, there are things that could be done about this and a friendly or positive form of, you know, applying technology with artificial intelligence could perhaps create a positive future. Um, so, you know, we're going through a period now where the tech clash has been happening. Uh, for the last few years, uh, uh, which is a, a reaction against technology to some degree. Uh, yeah. uh, in Toronto here, we had the Google uh, uh, Harbour Front development. It was supposed to be a, a, a smart city lab, I guess. It was an area of the city that was derelict, which was going to be given to Google to create a community. Uh, well, not given to Google, but with Google, they were going to create a community. Uh, and that, uh, over the past three or four years, develop, you know, plans for that were developed and were eventually cancelled because of the public mm. backlash to that uh, around concerns around privacy and uh, ownership of data, the power Google would have in the community and that type of thing. And that seemed to reflect a changing public view of technology um, that is kind of what we would call the tech lash. Whether that will be sufficient to influence AI in a positive direction, I don't know, but it does seem to reflect an, uh, a, a view of skeptic more skepticism about technology and more awareness that there are possible bad consequences. I don't know whether that's yeah. going to offset what you're totally. describing. Yeah, I I'm not sure if it'll offset it, but it's a, to me, it's an extremely powerful sign. It means that um, it means that uh, Google did not get into the pockets of the politicians soon enough. In America, Google has so many lobbyists in Washington con contributing to so many campaigns, and what the, what that means to me is that is that Toronto somehow became immune to Google's Google's dollars, um, and then and also there was a public outcry. And that's an even better sign. There have been a number of uh, strikes by Google employees uh, who refused, for example, to work on an uh, a object recognition software that was going to be used by the Defense Department to create probably autonomous battlefield drones and robots. But they, the, the Google the Google employees said, "We don't want to work on that," and they refused. And they and they and there's their thing about creating a union, which is really unheard of in technology. This is. And I find this very encouraging because it's a ground ground up uh, re re revolt from from the public, but also from the people who are employed in these companies. Now that that is a really good sign. And if you combine that with with active politicians like like Mr. Yang, 
um, I think that is the pot that is the ray of sunshine I don't expect um, I don't expect that all these organizations that are trying to trying to battle ethics and create safety are really going to be that effective until we get serious government uh, and I hate to say government um, oversight or government regulation but until we get something like you know we have the inter the IAEA the International Atomic Energy Agency that governs uh, the refinement of uranium development of missiles we need that for for AI and the fact that people are are, are the tech lashing back in Toronto is such a such a great uh, a great example of of, of uh, the path that will lead to regulation and that regulation seems to be higher on the agenda at the moment uh, and but it does raise the question of the power of the technology companies versus individual nation states and you know the, the battle between Australia and Google at the moment over news um, perhaps yeah. partly influenced by Rupert Murdoch he's Australian the Australian government is the one that are going against Google and uh, Murdoch's yeah. not very keen on Google so there may be an there may be a, a so then some of that going on there but the European community seem to be doing things as well where they're trying starting to challenge the power of big tech and even the Chinese government they were you know very friendly with their tech companies and over the past few weeks we've seen a a, 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 a gap appear there uh, more regulation being suggested and you know, probably coming in China over their tech companies. So that that collision seems to be starting to happen to some degree. What the outcome will be, we don't know, but there does seem to be a bit more of a collision there than we've seen in the past. And if there is a ray of light, it's this it's this kind of thing. I I I, uh, I think these are all exceptionally good signs. Um, I, I'm skeptical of of China. Ch you know what's happening with. Um, Here's, a, here's another example of, of AI that's gone crazy is uh, facial recognition technology. Technology is being used to help them, the Chinese, round up the Uyghurs and put them in concentration camps in Western China. The Uyghurs are an ethnic minority. They're also a Muslim. I've spent some time in Western China. It's a very rich culture. And what, what China typically does with, with areas they want to dominate is they ship a lot of Han Chinese there and basically overpopulate the, the area with Han Chinese, but that wasn't working in Western China. So now they've rounded up more than a million Uyghurs in concentration camps and they, they recognize Uyghurs through facial recognition technology. If they, if they manage to get away, it's really such a scary sci-fi scenario. If they manage to get away, they can be picked up elsewhere when they're, when they're recognized by these, by the, by the surveillance system. Now we think, Oh, that, what a horrible thing China's doing. Well, the company Palantir, in America is using facial recognition technology to round up immigrants on our border. And they're part of this whole whole juggernaut of, of the, the during the Trump administration of mistreating immigrants, separating families, um, uh, separating children from their parents. We have, there's more than 500 children on our, in basically jails on our border that who've been separated from their parents and, they, and they've lost track of their parents. In their in their in their brilliant thinking they never thought well maybe we should keep the names and addresses of the parents or some relatives somewhere so that these poor these children some as young as like 10 months old won't won't be uh, separated forever and and here's a tech here again here's ai abetting the, these crimes um i don't mean to go back go back to the negative side because we were talking about <laughs> about the positive side but these are the sorts of things that i think encourage a, a tech a tech lash the goal to me is not to get rid of AI. I think AI is, a, you know, believe it or not, I think AI, AI is a wonderful technology. Uh, it's a wonderful set of technologies. It will, it'll, it's, it'll help us tremendously in healthcare. It'll help us tremendously in, in climate change. You, you posed a question about um, COVID. Hmm. Uh, COVID, uh, AI has been really helpful in, in COVID issues, in, in mapping the pandemic. Uh, in in uh, in doing triage for for patients, which patients need to be treated first, and now which patients need to get the vaccine first. AI has been part of that. So there's a lot to be there's a lot to be uh, 
a lot to be positive about if we get through if we get through this period. The, I, I did ask that question about COVID, and um, what I was thinking about with it too was the impact that COVID is having on AI more broadly, in the sense of perhaps there being a lot more data uh, uh, that is now available because people are spending their lives more online uh, and possibly yeah. other aspects of that too, just based on the fact that that people are doing a lot more things with technology because of COVID. You know, you're right. I, I, I knew that, um, you know, Intel did a survey and found that uh, the number of companies using artificial intelligence has nearly doubled since the COVID outbreak. Mm -hmm. um, they're using, they're using it, as I said, for epidemic modeling, uh, for predicting patient outcomes, uh, for triaging, for drug discovery. Yeah, I'm sure AI played a part in, in developing these vaccines. Um, but, you know, early intervention analytics, it's, 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 that's a really, that's a powerful pandemic tool. Uh, clinical decision making, um, making decisions in clinics about, about, again, about what patients to see and what treatments. It's been a boom for AI, um, and AI has been very helpful. So maybe the next pandemic we encounter, because you know, zoonotic diseases or diseases that jump out of the animal kingdom will always be there. There will always be new diseases coming from the animal world. So maybe the next pandemic won't, won't hurt us quite so badly because of the good things AI does. I hope so, and, uh, uh, and possibly even with this pandemic, with the variants, the ability, I don't know what's required to create uh, vaccines or new variations of the vaccine to be able to cope with the variants in, of, of COVID-19. You know, perhaps artificial intelligence is going to help with that. I would, I would imagine with all these systems getting online, you know, the, the number of companies really doubling is quite, quite extraordinary mm. uh, using mm. AI. Um, mm. The amount of the amount invested in AI doubles every year already. Yeah. Uh, it, it's around, it's around 30 billion now by 2030 says Gartner and company uh, AI and automation will add $16 trillion to the global GDP, which is just, probably the biggest sector of the economy by 2030. Mm -hmm. So ironically, while it's taking 50% of the jobs, it, the GDP presumably is going to be underpinned by, by AI. But yeah, it's, um, I mean, if we, if we navigate this correctly, then there, there are, uh, there are benefits. And this is, this kind of, uh, this feeds into your, your ideas about corporations and what, you know, how, how they're using, AI and what 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 should govern them? Uh, yes, and that's I mean, given the discussion we've had so far about uh, the negative consequences. It raises this question about uh, you know if a company is considering uh, their own use of AI, maybe they've done a little bit of it already. Uh, certainly, there are lots, as you have said, that are. Uh, that see it as an important part of their future. Uh, mm -hmm. What should they be thinking? Why, you know, how should they approach this? Um, it's it's an issue of corporate governance. You know, um, corporations have a bunch of stakeholders to satisfy, not just stockholders, but their own employees, their boards of directors. And they, there's there's been uh, data to show that if you adopt AI. Um, all of your stakeholders think more highly of you and all your investors and your customers all think more highly of you if you've got an obvious and uh, transparent application of AI. So AI is a good thing. Um, if you use AI badly, it will reflect on your bottom line if you, if you, if you misuse AI. Uh, I'll give you an example, Foxconn, which is the largest industrial manufacturer, they make most of the iPhones. They're China, based in Foxconn City in China, they recently, a couple of years ago now, but they uh, they bought they laid off they bought thirty thousand robots to replace thirty thousand people. Well, if you're a normal company and you do something like that, it reflects poorly on you. If suddenly thirty thousand people are let loose, it doesn't seem to have any impact on Foxconn because they they they're they're so rich and 
is not a giant uh, hue and cry in China because there's a giant clamp on, on freedom of speech. Um, but if you're a company, it behooves you to, in, to use AI, but to use it very responsibly because it, it tends to be very transparent. Your use of it will get out. So if you're using it to develop uh, weapons, well, some of your, some of your uh, shareholders are going to like that because they don't, they don't mind developing weapons. Some of your shareholders and maybe even your employees are not going to like that. So as a corporation, you've got to carefully consider the whole corp your corporate stewardship. Your, 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 um, you know, what, what, do you, what, what kind of corporation do you want to be? If you're a corporation that has, it has a lot of interpersonal relationships with other companies, you probably don't want to replace your employees with robots because robots really stink at interpersonal relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and they will for the foreseeable future. So there's a lot to think about as a corporation. I mean, there's if you can use AI, it's a it's a big problem solver. But it's also it can also displace employees. Um, so you've got to you've got to take these things into consideration. I mean, you almost seem to be saying that as companies consider, I would describe it as their technology use more generally. There is this wider uh, uh, environment or, or these wider aspects that they should be considering and that uh, is something that maybe they're not doing enough of at the moment uh, certainly we know that what, what I'm coming to with this is that uh, only 30% of companies that make a significant technological investment uh, often, you know, they would describe it as digital transformation. Only 30% of them regard what they've done as successful, which to me is, is, is a, a statistic that should be way more shocking than it actually is. Uh, mm. You know, to think that uh, there is this great optimism, you've described it about artificial intelligence. I would certainly, you know, uh, agree, agree that it exists. I don't see and he's saying that that's not true. And yet it only works a third of the time. If you can imagine, if, you, if you're going out there, anything else that we purchase, uh, you know, if 30%, if only 30% of the apples that we <laughs> bought when we went to the supermarket were, you know, edible, um, then <laughs> that, that would be an issue. You know, the yes. world would be concerned about that. We would want to solve that problem. But with technology and companies, there is this big gap and uh, you know I'm writing something about this at the moment but it seems to me that it's a, sh a, a there's a big uh, disconnect around this number of 30 percent getting it wrong and yeah possibly part of that is is a failure to take into account the broader consequences and uh, environment that the technology is being implemented in. That's a really great observation. I didn't know it was as low as 30%. Hmm. Um, but that shows there's there's a kind of bandwagon approach to AI, like if it's the new elixir and everybody's got to get some. And so, but what they're not looking at is the downstream you know, impact. Do you really need the AI? Is the AI you're using the appropriate AI? How do you, how do you get it implemented with companies that, you know, no company, except some of the older ones, have a much of a track record in AI. Um, so how do you judge the, how do you judge the poser, posers from the, from the real experts? Um, and th those are all, those are all, all challenging questions, but it's part of, part of the aphorism that I, I like to use is that our stewardship, our uh, innovation runs ahead of our stewardship. Yes. We, we, we develop things and then we, then we, <laughs> We <laughs> chase behind them, going, "Oh, we didn't, we didn't want that to happen." Uh, and there's some really horrific examples. I mean, um, take take my favorite example is nuclear fission. In the 1920s and 30s, now let's go back in time. In the 1920s and 30s, fission was thought of as a way to get free energy. You get you split the atom, you get free energy, and then this period of utopia would follow, which is very much like today's singularity concept. That this period of utopia will follow once we achieve human level intelligence in a machine. Um, but what happened with uh, fission? Well, we we incinerated two cities full of people, um, and then we got in the Cold War with Russia, where we held a gun 
to our own heads for 50 years and even up till today. There's still 70,000 or so nuclear warheads hanging out in the world, armed and ready to go. Um, why? So we had no maintenance plan for that technology. We just developed it as rapidly as we could. Now we're sitting around with, with 70,000 weapons, each of which could destroy Hiroshima 10 times over. Um, and we've got crazy countries like uh, dictators like uh, Kim in North Korea yeah. brandishing nuclear brandishing nuclear weapons. Well, that technology you'd have to say was is on balance a failure. Um, you know, Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. We don't have a way to 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 to, to get rid of the. You know, we have accidents with these these this technology, and then we'd have no way to store the waste. Um, and then we have these weapons. So. That's a failure, and we've almost made ourselves extinct several times with with fission. Unfortunately, AI is tracking fission very closely. We've already weaponized it. We're we're developing it willy nilly. The amount invested each year doubles. Um, our innovation is is and and now there's a there's a following this giant wagon train of progress. Are these people and organizations saying, "Hey, wait a minute, let's 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 look at let's." look at some scenarios for, for the future. They, they may not look good, we better do something now. So our, our innovation runs ahead, our stewardship follows. And generally it takes a chastening accident for us to get, get our stuff together. It takes a Three Mile Island or a Chernobyl or a Bhopal. You know, one time we used to think, well, there's nothing wrong with developing a pesticide factory in the middle of a hugely populated city. And it's, it, this happened with Union Carbide and, and in Bhopal, India, um, if I'm not, 16,000 people, I believe, were killed, uh, something like 300,000 were injured, uh, Union Carbide's answer was to sell off the company and to pay off the, some of the people and then sell off the company. So we've got to worry about that with AI, not just in implementation, but in safety. You know, if, if, it, if we buy, if we pay somebody to help us with AI and it fails, that's a, a lost cost. But if it, if it destroys things, if we have a terrible accident, you know, Wendell Wallach, who's an ethicist at Yale University, has said that with automation, we're going to need a chastening accident to, uh, to learn. And I think that's true of automation. I think that's true of AI. The, the, air, the airline example is an excellent example of a chastening accident. We should be, we should be chastened by that. We should learn. Yeah, that 30% number comes from, it comes from one of the consultancies. I think it's Deloitte or Boston Consultant Group or McKinsey. Mm. It's one of those. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the, the that discussion uh, reminds me of a discussion that I had not so long ago where I was with a bunch of chief information officers from companies and there was someone there from a tech company uh, and the discussion was around uh, you know, uh, future use of technology, uh, investment in it of some kind. And the argument that the technology person made was, was that there was an extent to which companies that were going to be users of the technology just had to have faith that the technology was going to do good uh, for the company, you know, that it was going to be worth their while investing in technology. And I was shocked by this, but uh, it, was in the con it was in the context of the companies uh, thinking about, you know, how could they be more innovative? And uh, it was one of these things where someone said, you know, do we need to take more risk? You know, we're risk averse. And of course, in Canada, we're apparently more risk averse than the US. But the uh, but this was the idea that you uh, the way to approach this was to say, well, we do, we're not really sure what's going to happen, but we'll buy the technology and install it. And I, I reacted to this quite strongly. And I said, surely as someone who runs a company and has a senior role in a company, you should never make any decision that you don't have a degree of, of confidence about what the outcome is going to be. Right. Yeah. Uh, but this was the point. It, it, to me, it was a, you know, a, a revelatory moment in the sense that there is an element of the way that technology is considered today 
uh, in the, the sense of the the benefits that it might provide or the the uh, consequences of not using it perhaps that is that that has an element of this to it that you know you've just got to get more of it that sounds like an epitaph on on a on a corporate you know like at, yeah. at the corporation at the corporation graveyard there should be a lot of tombstones that, that were like just just trust us yeah have faith have yeah. faith that it'll work you know and, and there's no evil yeah right right do you know evil and now now i mean the company that 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 uh that coined that slogan is just like oh my god they're just they're, they're the greediest and most avaricious imaginable mm -hmm. um but but they're part i mean their success i think has made a lot of other companies go hey look we got to get some of that ai uh at whatever cost let's just have faith that it will work and this is why 30 percent, as you said only 30 percent are successful it's that kind of bandwagon mentality but it's but but we know there are really good applications for ai but there, there, there but there's sometimes when companies look at a technology and say no uh walmart recently somebody they, they had this giant plan to automate a lot of what they do and you know walmart is full of greeters and people there's all kinds of people there's uh a lot of checkout people they wanted they, there was a plan to automate a bunch of that but walmart wisely backed off they said, no, we're not going to automate because they realize a lot of what your experience is at Walmart is about getting greeted and having a checkout person mm. and having and not doing uh, warehouse stocking like uh, like Amazon does. They're not there. It's a different business model. It's in a bunch of communities and employs a bunch of community people. And that's part of what they do. That's part of their corporate corporate governance. So. It's nice to see a company say, "Look at automation, or look at AI." And go, well, maybe, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I'd rather put some money in people-to-people -people contact, use you know, develop skills of emotional intelligence, uh, seek seek my customers that way. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I had cause to think about Walmart uh, a year or so ago. I talked to them about some stuff, and the. Uh, and for them to try and become Amazon was really the question in my mind. You know, how, how can they compete with that? What should their strategic uh, approach to that be? And, uh, you know, the thing I couldn't remove from my mind was that they had all these big boxes all over the place. And, and that was their starting point. They're very good at the greeting and things, but they're not, uh, you know, a... a, 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 a an online retailer organized yeah. to supply masses of people and uh, uh, individually in their homes. And uh, the, the extent of the transition that that would mean for Walmart is, you know, is very big. <laughs> that, that, that would be, it's be like creating another company. You can't really, it, whether you can take what they've got now and turn it into Amazon, I'm not sure that that's realistic to think about. It, I don't think it is in the short term. And I think in the short term, it's been kind of a failure. What they what they tr what they they try to do initially, and I'm not sure if this is still their policy, but they were trying to get the manufacturers. So they they get an order and instead of storing it at Amazon, storing it at Walmart and shipping it out, they send the order to the company that makes it, and they ship it out. So then you've got uh, a a wide variety of of uh, competence at shipping things out. And, and you get suddenly you get companies that haven't done been in the shipping business before trying to quickly ramp up to shipping their own products instead of sending it to Walmart. And so far, I think it's been kind of a failure. Mm -hmm. So you don't become Amazon overnight. Um, and then, you know, then you have to ask, you know, why is it I want to become Amazon? Is that going to, you know, I guess revenue, you know, Amazon's revenue is, is just astounding. Uh, Jeff Bezos gets divorced and his wife becomes the second richest woman in the world it's just it's just it's my it's my, it's 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 money that's just it's mind-boggling and, and, and i think it's confusing mm. Um, mm. yeah but, but i think our discussion seems to suggest that there may be solutions to the challenge that's faced by uh, tech-based companies uh for traditional companies that is uh, you know, it has a technology-based element to it, but also is based on their strengths in working with people 
and uh, you know, and 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 other aspects of what they do. I think the strongest companies are going to be the ones that emphasize uh, not necessarily AI, but person-to-person -person contact. Um, I, when I talk to students, I always and they, they're talking. They always wonder about the job market, which really looks bad uh, for them in traditional jobs. But if they look at if you look at jobs where emotional intelligence is required, like teachers, um, there'll be a, there'll be actually more competition for teaching jobs because teaching jobs are, are tough to you can't you can't get a computer to do it very well. Um, uh, any kind of any kind of counseling job, any kind of psych psychological counseling. There's a giant need in America for more psychologists uh, and counselors and uh, and social workers, and these are jobs that 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 machines will not be able to do very well. Mm -hmm. Pediatricians. Uh, it's going to be a long time before we trust our our, our kids to robots. So there is, there is and and you know a lot of companies can learn from can learn from that. Mm -hmm. That automation may not be their 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 golden goose. So I've just got one more question. We're coming to the sure. end of our time. Uh, and it, it's related to what you've just been saying, uh, which is the people who are watching this, a lot of them will be going on to work for the major technology companies. We have a lot of people who go from Waterloo to Google and Microsoft and goodness knows where else. Uh, uh, or they'll be working with more traditional organizations on their use of technology. Uh, and so uh, I sense that your guidance to them may be around uh, uh, people-based jobs. Uh, but, uh, but have you got any words you'd like, to, uh, advice you'd like to leave them with? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> No, they they face a, an an awesomely uh, an awesome future. I I I I'd, I'd love to I'd love to be a, a college student right now because I think the technology we're gonna they're gonna have in, in by the time they're they're in their fifties and sixties is going to be simply mind blowing if we navigate the future correctly. Uh, I th I think for them, especially business students, it comes back to the principles of corporate governance. Who are your stakeholders? Um, how are they best served, including your stockholders, but not limited to your stockholders? If you're going to uh, use automation and you, you, you project that people will be unemployed, how are you going to retrain them? Or are you simply going to let them go? Now that could, could impact your bottom line. That could impact your reputation. Um, but also, you know, losing money by not automating will also impact your bottom line and your reputation. So you've got to, you've got to tread this line carefully. Don't adopt AI unless it's unless it's necessary, and then make sure you've got a model that's been proven successful in the past. And unfortunately, the past is very short for for AI. You can't look back too far. You can look back to like two thousand nine, two thousand ten for big AI implementation. Um, but but use what works. Don't try to be innovative within an innovative techno an innovative sphere. Uh, and uh, make and make ethical decisions. I mean, not everybody has to be. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made in, in, in making weapons, but you may not, you, you know, you, you may not want to make weapons, and your 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 shareholders may not want you to make weapons or contribute to making weapons. This was the issue at Google with the object recognition that these programmers decided not to work on. Um, but corporate governance is an idea that comes to me more and more because I think more and more. People are going to have corporations are going to have to build AI into their uh, fundamental principles, into their into their bylaws and their constitution, um, into their in, and they're going to have to have a, a part in their annual reports about it. So it's not going to go away. Embrace it and then just try and try and be prescient. Good advice. Uh, thank you for uh, talking to me today, James, and the students at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed it, and uh, I'm glad we were able to do it. Well, Peter, the, the pleasure was mine. I've enjoyed this very much, and I, 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 I swear I'm going to steal some of your ideas. Uh, they're <laughs> free. Just, I will. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity, and, and to your students, best of luck. It's a challenging world, but you know, I'm sure you're up to it. <laughs>